Hi, everyone. Sorry, I am a little bit late today. Um, the morning got away from me. What can I say? Um, we are on Chapter 7 of the Yearling. And if you'll remember last time, I'm going to readjust my chair here. Um, if you'll remember last time, we were at the Forester's house with uh, with Penny and Jody. Um, Penny's problem is that he needs a new gun. They are they don't have a lot of money, so um, he's gone to the Foresters to barter for a new gun, and he's doing it in a backwards way by telling the absolute truth about the little feist dog, the little uh, terrier. Telling him he's a terrible bear dog. He's just a runt. He's no good at all. I mean, he wouldn't give that dog to anybody if they even asked him. But in reality, he is wetting the whistle of the foresters who can't imagine why anyone would talk so bad about their dog. So, I'm going to open the chat box here and um, see if anyone's there. I just want to say hello. Denisha, hi. Good to see you. Um, let's start Chapter 7 of The Yearling. And I'm going to put on my glasses. You know what? My glasses broke. So I'm, I'm one-sided. I'm lopsided. So please don't make fun of my poor glasses. <laughs> I do have another pair, but they're way somewhere. I don't know where they are, so I'll just use these. Chapter 7. Uh, Mr. Forrester, oh, Paul Forrester said, Well, neighbor, let's have the news about that tormented bear. Ma Forrester said, Yes, and you scrapers get the dishes washed before you get too deep into it, too. Her sons rose hurriedly, each with his own plate and some larger dish or pan. Jody stared at them. He would as soon as ha he would as soon have expected them to tie ribbons in their hair. She tweaked his ear on her way to her rocker. I got no girls, she said. If these fellers wants me to cook for them, they can just clean up after me. Jody looked at his father, pleading mutely that this piece of heresy be not taken home to Baxter's Island. The foresters made short work of the dishes. Fodderwing hobbled after them, gathering the scraps for all the animals. Only by feeding the pack of dogs himself could he be sure of saving tidbits for his pets as well. Remember, he has the raccoon and some other pets. I forget what they are. He smiled to himself that there would be so much to take today to take to them. There was even enough cold food left for supper. Jody gaped at the abundance. The foresters finished their work in a clatter and hung the iron pots and kettles on nails near the hearth. They drew up their cowhide chairs and hand-hewn benches around Penny. Some lit corncob pipes and other shaved pairings of tobacco from dark plugs. Ma Forrester lived a little snuff. Buck picked up Penny's gun and a small file and began to work on the loose hammer. Well, Penny began, he'd taken us plumb by surprise. Jody shivered. He slipped in like a shadow and killed our brood sow. Laid her open end to end and only ate a mouthful. Not hungry, just low down and mean. Penny paused to light his own pipe. The foresters bent to him with blazing splinters of fat pine. He come as quiet as a black cloud into the wind, made a circle to get his wind right. So quiet the dogs never hid nor scented him. Even this one, even this one, he leaned to stroke the face at his feet was fooled. The foresters exchanged glances. We set out after breakfast, Jody and me, and all three of the dogs. We tracked that bear across the south scrub. We tracked him along the edge of sawgrass ponds. We tracked him through Juniper Bay. We tracked him through the swamp, the trail getting hotter and hotter. 
We come up on him. The foresters gripped their knees. We come up on him. We come up with him, men, right smack at the edge of Juniper Creek, where the water flows swiftest and deepest. The story, Jody thought, was even better than the hunt. He saw it all again, the shadows and the fern, the broken palmettos and the running branch water. He was bursting with the excitement of the story. He was bursting, too, with pride in his father. Penny Baxter, no bigger than a dirt dauber, could out-hunt the best of them. And he could sit as he sat now, weaving a spell of mystery and magic that held these huge hairy men eager and breathless. He made the fight an epic thing. When his gun backfired and old Slewfit foot crushed Julia to his breast, Gabby swallowed his tobacco and rushed to the fireplace, spitting and choking. The foresters clenched their fists and sat precariously at the edges of their seats and listened with their mouths open. God, but breathe, I'd have loved to have been there. And where's Slewfoot gone? Gabby begged. No man knows, Penny told them. There was silence. Lim said at last, You ain't never once met that, mentioned that dog you got there. Don't press me, Penny said. I done told you he's worthless. I notice he come out and in mighty good shape. Not a mark on him, is there? Nope. There's nary a mark on him. Takes a mighty clever dog to fight a bear and not get air scratch on him. Penny puffed on his pipe. Liam rose and walked to him, towering over him. He cracked his knuckles. He was sweating. I want two things, he said hoarsely. I want to be in at the death of old Slewfoot. And I want that dog there. Oh, my, no, Penny said mildly. I'd not cheat you trading him. No use lying to me. Name your trade. I'll trade you old Rip instead. Thank you, Foxy. I got better dogs than Rip now. Lem went to the wall and took down from its nails a gun. It was a London fine twist. The double barrel shone. The stock was walnut, warm and glowing. The twin hammers were jaunty. The fittings were chaste and intri intri intricate. Blah, I couldn't say that word. Lim swung it to his shoulder, sighted it. He handed it to Penny. Right from England, no more muzzle loading. Fill your own shell cases, easy as spitting. Stick your shells in, breach your cocker, bam, bam. Two shots. Shoots as true as an eagle flies. Swap even. Oh my, no, Penny said. This here gun is valuable. There's no, there's more where it come from. Don't argue with me, man. When I want a dog, I want a dog. Take the gun for him or by God, I'll come and steal him. Well, all right then, Penny said. If that's the way it stands, but you got to promise before witnesses not to beat the very pudding out of me after you've hunted him. Shake, a hairy paw closed over Penny's hand. Here, boy. Lem whistled to the vice. He took him by the scruff of the neck and led him outside, and though fearful even now of losing him. Penny teetered in his chair. He balanced the gun indifferently across his knees. Jody could not take his eyes from its perfection. He was filled with awe that his father had outwitted a forester. He wondered if Lim would keep his promise. He had heard of the intricacies of trading, but it had never occurred to him that one man could get the best of another by the simple expedient of telling him the truth. Talk went on into the afternoon. Buck had tightened up Penny's old muzzle loader so that he thought it could be counted on. The foresters were unhurried. 
unoccupied. Tales were told of old Slewfoot's smartness of other bears before him, but none so clever as he. Chases were described in every detail. Dogs, 20 years dead, were called by name and by performance. Fodderwing grew tired of them and wanted to go to the pond and fish for minnows. But Jody could not bear to leave this telling of old tales. Pa and Ma Forrester chirped and shrilled occasionally, then dozed off in between, like sleepy crickets. At last, their infirmities took them over and they slept soundly, side by side in their rockers. Their dried old frames stiff even in their slumber. Penny stretched and rose. He said, I hate to leave good company. Spend a night, we'll have a fox chase. I thank you, but I don't like to leave my place with no man on it. Father Wing tugged at his arm. Leave Jody, stay with me. He ain't half seen my things. Buck said, leave the young and stay, Penny. I got to go to Volusia tomorrow. I'll ride him by your place. His ma rare, Penny said. That's what ma's is good for, eh, Jody? Pa, I'd be mighty proud to stay. I ain't played none in a long while. Not since the day before yesterday. Well, stay then if these folks are sure you're welcome. Liam, don't kill the boy if you try it the fast before Buck gets home to me. Gets him home to me. They shouted with laughter. Penny shouldered the new gun with his old one and went for his horse. Jody followed. He reached out one hand and stroked the smoothness of the gun. <clears throat> if, if, if twas anybody in the world but Lim, Penny murmured, I'd be too shamed to go home with it. I've owed Lim a trimming since he named me. You told him the truth. My words were straight, but my intentions was crooked as the o Oklawaha River. What'll he do when he finds out? He'll want to tear me down, and after that, I'm hoping he'll laugh. Goodbye, son, till tomorrow. Be good now. The foresters followed to see him off. Jody waved after his father with a new sense of aloneness. He was almost tempted to call him back, to run after him and climb up in the saddle and ride home with him to the snugness of the clearing. Father Wing called. The coon's fishing in a puddle, of puddle Jody, come see. He ran to watch the coon. It was paddling about in a small pool of water, feeling with its human hands for something only instinct told it it could be there. He played with fodder wing and the coon the rest of the afternoon. He helped to clean the squirrel's box and build a cage for a crippled red bird. The foresters had game chickens as wild as themselves. The hens laid their eggs all over the adjacent woods and briarberry tangles under piles of brush, and the snake ate as many as the hens hatched. He went with Father Wing to collect the eggs. A hen was setting. Father Wing gave her the eggs they had gathered. There were 15 in all. This is a good mother, he said. It appeared that he took charge of all such matters. Again, Jody longed for something of his own. Father Wing could give him the fox squirrel, even he believed the baby coon, but past experience had taught him not to aggravate his mother with another mouth, no matter how small, to feed. Father Wing talked to the setting hen. You stay on the nest now, you hear me? You hatch all them eggs into biddies. I want yellow biddies this time. None of them blackens. They turned back toward the cabin. The coon came crying to meet them. It scrambled up Father Wing's cro crooked legs and back and snugged down, clasping his neck. It closed its small white teeth over his skin and shook its head with pretended ferocity. Father Wing let Jody carry it to the cabin. It looked up at him with inquiring bright eyes, aware of his strangeness, then accepted him. The foresters had scattered over their land at shores, which they took leisurely in their stride. Buck and Arch drove the pinned cows. They took leisure. Um, Buck and Arch drove the pinned cows and their calves to the pond to water. Mill Wheel fed the string of horses in the corral. Pack and Lim had disappeared into the dense woods, 
north of the cabin. Perhaps, Jody speculated, to their still. There was ease and abundance here as well as violence. There were so many of them to do things. Penny Baxter carried the work of a clearing almost as large as theirs alone. Jody remembered guiltily the unhoed rows of corn he had left behind him, but Penny would not mind finishing them. Pa and Ma Forrester were still asleep in their chairs. The sun was red in the west. Darkness came quickly into the cabin, for the live oaks kept out light that would have still been still bright at the Baxter's clearing. One by one, the brothers trooped into the cabin. Fodder Wing started up the fire on the hearth to heat the leftover coffee. Jody saw Ma Forrester open one careful eye, then close it again. Her sons piled the cold food on the table with a clatter that would have awakened an owl in the daytime. She sat up and prodded Pa Forrester in the ribs and joined the rest at their supper. This time they cleaned every platter. There was not even food left for the dogs. Fodderwing mixed a pan of cold cornbread with a bucket of clabber and took it outside for them. He swung crookedly from side to side tilting the bucket, and Jody ran to help him. After supper, the foresters smoked and talked of horses. The cattlemen in the country and farther to the west were complaining of a scarcity. Wolves and bears and panthers, panthers had raised havoc with the spring's colts. The traders who came usually from Kentucky with strings of horses had not appeared. The foresters agreed that it would be profitable to go north and west and trade for cattle ponies. Jody and Fodderwing lost interest in the talk and went into a corner to pay, play mumbledy peg. Ma Baxter would never have allowed pocket knives to be flipped into her clean, smooth floors. Here, a few splinters or more or less could make no difference. Jody sat up erect from the game. I know something I bet you don't know. What? The Spaniards used to cross the scrub right in front of our gate. Well, I know that, Father Wing hunched close and began to whisper excitedly. I seed him. Jody stared at him. What do you see? I see the Spaniards. They're tall and dark and have shiny helmets and they ride black horses. You couldn't have seen them. Ain't none left. They done left here just like the engines. Fodderwing closed one eye wisely. That's what folks tell you. You listen to me. Next time you go west to your sinkhole, you know that big magnolia with dogwood all around it? You look behind that magnolia. There's always a Spaniard on a black horse riding past that magnolia. The hair stiffened on Jody's neck. This was, of course, another of Fodderwing's tales. This was why his father and mother said Fodderwing was crazy. But he longed to believe it. It would do no harm to at least look behind the magnolia. The foresters stretched and, stretched and knocked out their pipes or spat out their tobacco. They went into their bedrooms, dropping their suspenders and loosening their britches. There was a bed for each for no two of them could sleep together in any double bed. Fodderwing led Jody to his own bed in a shed-like room under the kitchen eaves. You can have the pillow, he told him. Jody wondered if his mother would ask him if he had washed his feet. How freely the foresters lived, he thought, tumbling into bed without it. Fodderwing began a tall tale about the end of the world. It was empty and dark, he said, with only clouds to ride on. At first, Jody was interested. Then the tale became dull and rambling. He dropped off to sleep and dreamed of Spaniards riding clouds instead of horses. He awakened with a start late in the night. Din filled the cabin. His first thought was that the foresters were fighting again, but the shouts held a community of purpose, and Ma Forrester called encouragement. A door was banged open, and several of the dogs were hallooed inside. A light shone in the doorway of Fodderwing's room, and the dogs and men poured in. The men were stark naked 
and they looked thinner and less bulky, but they seemed as tall as a cabin. Ma Forrester held a lighted tallow candle. Her grasshopper frame was lost inside a large gray flannel nightgown. The dog shot under the bed and out again. Jody and Fodderwing scrambled to their feet. No one troubled to explain the commotion. The boys followed after the hunt. It led through every room and ended with a mad exit of the dogs through the torn mosquito netting that covered one window. They'll get him outside, Ma Forrester said, suddenly placid. Pesky vomit. Ma's got the best ear for vomits, Father Wing said proudly. I guess anybody hear him did he come scratching around their bedpost, she said. Pa Forrester hobbled into the room on his can. The night's near about done, he said. I'd rather have a snort of whiskey than sleep again. Buck said, Pa, you got the most sense for such an old blizzard, buzzard. He went to a cupboard and brought out the demijohn. The old man uncorked it and tipped it back and drank. Lim said, don't take no sense to crave liquor. Give it here. He took a deep draft and passed the jug on. He wiped his mouth and rubbed his bare stomach. He went to the wall and felt along it for his fiddle. He twanged the strings carelessly, then sat down and began to scrape a tune. Arch said, you ain't got that right, and brought his guitar and sat on the bench beside him. Ma Forrester set the candle on the table. She asked, you naked jaybirds fixing to sit up till day? Arch and Lim were deep in their cords and no one answered her. Buck took his mouth organ from a shelf. But pff, hang on. Buck took his mouth organ from a shelf and began a tune of his own. Arch and Lim stopped to listen, then fell in with his melody. Pa Forrester said, dog, take it. That's purty. The demijohn went around again. Pack brought out his juice harp and Mill Will his drum. Buck changed his plaintive song for a lively dance tune, and the idle music swung into full volume. Jody and Fodderwing dropped on the floor between Lim and Arch. Ma Forrester said, Now you needn't think I aim to go to bed and miss nothing. She unbanked the fire on the hearth and threw on fat wood and moved the coffee pot close. You hoot nows will eat breakfast soon, soon this morning, or I'll know why. She said, she winked at Jody, kill two birds with one stone, have a frolic and get breakfast done with. He went back at her. He felt bold and gay and tremulous. He could not understand how his mother could disapprove of such frolics and people. The music was out of tune and thunderous. It sounded like all the wild cats in the scrub rounded up together, but it had a rhythm and a gusto that satisfied the ear and soul. The wild chords went through Jody as though he, he too were a fiddle, and Lim Forrester drew long fingers across him. Lim said to him in a low voice, If I only had my sweetheart here to sing and dance. Jody asked freshly, Who all's your sweetheart? My little old twink Weatherby. Why, she's all over her toes, gal. Lim lifted his fiddle bow. Jody thought for an instant he meant to strike him. Then he went on with his fiddling, but his eyes smoldered. You say that again in your life, boy, and you'll not have a tongue left to say it with. Understand? Yes, Liam, I, could, I, could be I was wrong, he added eagerly. I'm just telling you. He felt depressed a while and disloyal to Oliver. Then the music caught him up again as though a great gust of wind lifted him across the treetops. The foresters went from dance tune to songs, and Pa and Ma Forrester joined the singing with shrill, wavering voices. Daylight came, and the mockingbirds in the live oak sang so clear and loud, the foresters heard them and laid down their pieces and saw the dawn in the cabin. Breakfast covered the table with some scantiness for a forester breakfast, for Ma had been too much occupied to do much cooking. The men pulled out on on only their britches, for the food was ready and smoking. After breakfast, they washed above their beards and put on their boots and shirts and went leisurely about their day's business. Buck saddled his big roan stallion and swung Jody up behind him on the rump, for there was not room for a feather with him in the saddle. 
Father Wing followed limping to the edge of the clearing with the raccoon on his shoulder and waved his stick in farewell until they were out of sight. Jody rode home with Buck to Baxter's Island and waved after him as he went on. He was still in a daze. It was only as he swung open the gate under the chinaberry tree. Chinaberry that he remembered he had forgotten to look behind the magnolia tree for a Spaniard riding. I kind of like that Forrester family. They sound really fun. It amazes me. They get up in the middle of the night and they sing and dance and oh my, 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 my word. Isn't that something to have a schedule like that? Well, I've got a lot of people here. Aubrey and Jay, Rose, Blue Sky, so good you guys came to visit with me. I'm so glad you came. All right, that's it. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his peace.